All right, let's start in chapter one. Chapter one is going to be dealing with change and continuity in international relations. And what I wanted to do, instead of starting with the first page or trying to pick up at the beginning of the chapter, I wanted to start with the broad concept of leadership. Where does leadership come from? How is it that different countries are ruled? Who maybe actually rules those countries? And there's three or four concepts up here that I wanted to hit on under leadership. One of them is going to be the idea of absolute monarchism. If you go back a few hundred years ago, if you go back a few hundred years ago in Europe, and this could be France, this could be Britain, this could be any number of those old European countries, they all had monarchs. They had kings, they had queens, mostly kings, but definitely some queens. And the idea behind absolute monarchism is this is not based upon the rule of law. This is not based upon, say, a constitution. This is not based upon votes. The king or the monarch does not get his or her authority from those areas. But rather, the king, the monarch, the queen, for this example, is actually going to be deriving their authority from above. They're going to be almost given the divine right of, of kings, if you will. The idea was, I am king because I have got this authority that comes down to me, say, from the heavens above, from God above. Now you're probably thinking this sounds a little bit crazy. I'm really glad that this went away hundreds of years ago. Anybody that's claiming this defined affinity with, with say, a, a heavenly or a godly being, well, not so fast. In the aftermath of World War II, what you'll find is that Japan, Japan's emperor during World War II actually publicly and openly proclaimed himself to be a god, to be a deity while World War II was going on. Now think about this. Japan was not exactly a backward country, and 1940, the 1940s, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, 1945, when World War II ended, those aren't exactly time periods that have, are that far away. That's only about six decades ago. So one of the terms, believe it or not, for the peace in World War II was that Japan's emperor had to get on the radio and had to address the Japanese population and, believe it or not, admit that he was not a deity, admit that he was not a god. This is a good example of absolute monarchism. Again, your leadership ability is not based upon laws. It's not based upon votes. It's not based upon a constitution. But rather, it's based upon the idea that you've got this divine authority that comes from above, from that religious or that heavenly figure that's up there. And this is something that the Japanese leader in the aftermath of World War II had to basically say, no, this isn't correct. The second example that I wanted to give you in terms of absolute monarchism was actually going to be Indonesia. Some folks will say that good leadership is a reflection of blessings from above. And again, the Japanese leader in World War II had suggested that he was a deity and ultimately had to rescind that idea at the defeat of World War II uh, to the hands of the Americans. Now having said this, Indonesia, and I've got another article here from July 24th of 2006. 2006, which is just a couple of years ago. In Indonesia, the things were going so badly over there. They were getting hit with tsunamis. They were getting hit with earthquakes. There were volcanoes that were either erupting or threatening to erupt. Anyway, bottom line is, is that there were an awful lot of natural disasters that were going on, and serious natural disasters. Believe it or not, the Indonesian culture began to fear that it was not actually natural disaster that was going on, but they began to suggest that it was the God above that had disfavor with their particular leader, and as such, that God above was actually punishing the country with these natural events. I give you absolute monarchism, again, the idea that authority comes from above, that it comes from a higher power. It can be a positive in the Japan example, or it can be a very negative example from Indonesia, meaning the God above is disproving of the leader and indeed is inflicting these kinds of natural disasters as a rebuke for that country for using that particular leader, for selecting that particular leader. Second thing that comes up is going to be popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty is the idea that a leader gets his or her ability to rule based upon the will of the people. In the United States, that would be based upon elections. When you think about Barack Obama, the newly elected president of the United States, he actually got a very comfortable majority of the American people to vote for him in November of 2008. And as soon as those votes were counted, as soon as it was determined that he got that clear majority, he was the one that was put into office and not John McCain. 
Popular sovereignty is the idea that the people are the ones that select the leaders, so the leaders will gain their authority to rule based on the people selecting them. That's what popular sovereignty is. When you go back to the American and the French revolutions, you'll see some other examples of popular sovereignty. In terms of the American Revolution, you probably will remember the phrase, no taxation without representation. The idea was, was that the British government was doing things that the people didn't want. The people revolted. They wrote a declaration of independence. They won a revolutionary war against the English with the help of the French. Ironically enough, the French, a few years after the American Revolution, had a French Revolution. When they had their revolution, it was not based on law anymore. It was actually based upon violence. It was not based upon elections, but it was based upon terror. They cut off people's heads with guillotine, guillotines and all sorts of different things along these lines. So you've got the American example that was really based upon law and was fairly peaceful. And then you've got the French example where they toppled the most powerful king in Europe and scared everybody. And it was very radical. If you walk into a Walmart and look around, I want you to think about this. Popular sovereignty means rule by the people. Do you really like the idea when you walk into a Walmart or when you walk into a McDonald's that these people are going to be in charge of your country? Indeed, it worked in the American example, but these same types of people were involved in the French Revolution and that one didn't work. So sometimes this is a good thing, sometimes it's not. We as Americans typically think that popular sovereignty is a very strong thing because it reflects the will of the people. But let me give you a couple of things to think about. In 2006, January of 2006, Kuwait's sheikh, the ruling sheikh of Kuwait, died in 2006. Now interestingly enough in Kuwait, they do not have elections there. Kuwait has actually had one family rule that country for over 250 years. Kuwait is also a country that's got a very high standard of living. Kuwait is a country that does not have an income tax. So we as Americans have a tendency to think, well, elections are the way to go. People need to have a voice. Well, if you go to a country like Kuwait, what you'll find is that they've had one ruling family that has ruled basically for over 250 years, longer than the entire life of the United States, without casting a single ballot. And aside from every once in a while having an invasion from the outside, maybe like Iraq, Kuwait has had a fairly wealthy and they've had a fairly stable existence. So popular sovereignty or rule by the people is not the only way to go. Iran, I've got another article from January of 2005 where Iran has elections. They have elections, but they also ban female candidates from running for various offices, including the president of the country. Now I want you to think about this. A country has elections, that sounds really good on its face, but if they don't allow everybody to run or they don't allow everybody to vote, then that would seem to raise some problems. And indeed, when you think about Iran, you don't think about them as being the greatest democracy in the world. That's not to say that they are or that they aren't. That's just to suggest that the perception is, is that they aren't. So with this in mind, just because you have votes like the United States, Iran and the United States are not the same thing. Kuwait doesn't have any votes at all. And in the grand scheme of things, they're still a very stable country. One last example that I want to give you is actually going to be from Kenya. If you go back to January of 2008, or a little bit more than about a year and a half ago, Kenya had a very strong uh, de democratic election. They had an incredible turnout. Now, uh, Barack Obama has got some ties with Kenya. Problem was, was that in 2008, when they had this strong turnout, the election was so close, they could not determine a definitive winner, and they could not determine a definitive winner for months, for months in Kenya. Now, Kenya is one of the most moderate African countries on the entire continent. They are one of the ones that is very, very stable, and, and democracy has been a wonderful thing as a general rule there. But when they could not determine who won the election because of how close it was, violence broke out. People by the tens of thousands, maybe even the hundreds of thousands, were forced from their homes. So I guess my point is, is that while popular sovereignty or that rule by the people notion sounds really good in the American context, there is democracy in Iran, but it's not the same. There is democracy in Kenya, but it's not as stable. And just because you don't have votes like they do in Kuwait, in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't make you a failure as a country. Now I'm going to take a break for just a second and come back with these last two, and I'm going to introduce the sovereignty paper for this first week.